Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, hi, Rockbrook. Happy March, everybody. So good to see you. Man, those who are struggling with spring allergies, I'm praying for you. No reminder that the world is not your home, like being allergic to the air, but uh, that's what we are. We're in week five of this series we're calling Align. Uh, you being here today is a testimony of your commitment to the things that we've already studied in this spiritual growth campaign. This weekend, we're looking at serving Christ. Then next week, we'll be talking about sharing Christ. Then we'll have a capstone to the whole thing. And then it will be Serve Day weekend, uh, which you'll hear uh, more about in a little bit today. Uh, but then the last weekend of the month is Easter weekend. Uh, now, we want to help you and your family celebrate Easter. So we've planned five identical services that weekend, starting with Saturday night at 5 and 6.30, then Sunday morning at 9, 10, 15, and 11.30. As you begin planning which service you will attend, I'll be praying for those who you can bring with you to an Easter service. I'm so looking forward to the weeks ahead. I just want to thank you for championing this church-wide spiritual growth campaign, the investment you've put into our weekend services, to our worship gatherings, to small groups, to uh, students and kids. Uh, We've been marching through the five action steps, the five verbs, the five purposes that flow from the great commandment and the great commission. And this week we come to the fourth attribute of a healthy church, and that is the church is a community who cares. We saw the church in Acts 2, all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Uh, Why do they do that? It's because it flows out of uh, the great commandment that says, love your neighbor as yourself. So just as you take care of yourself, take care of other people. Now, love is not just a feeling. It's got to be shown. So we are aligned to God's will when we are serving Christ. And we serve Christ when we serve like Christ, when we serve uh, his body, the church. So we've added a cog to our commitment wall this week of this revolving around Christ, of serving Christ. I love hearing what your kids are getting out of this series and this time Rockbrook for Kids is talking about serving this weekend as well. Uh, Pastor Don and uh, those who help with our children's ministry asked me to just uh, look into my phone once a week and just say, hey, don't make it a big deal. Just look in your phone, make a quick video, talk about what uh, their parents are talking about next door. And we'll show that over here and show the alignment between uh, the two things. So I've been doing that, and I wanted to show you this week's video. Would you watch this, please? Hi, Rockbrook for Kids. My name is Ryland, pastor at Rockbrook Church. I'm here at this barn because this week we're talking about serving. And I wanted to share with you one of my favorite Bible verses. It's Proverbs 14, 4. Without oxen, a stable stays clean but you need a strong ox for a large harvest. Another way to say this verse might be, it's easy to keep a stable or barn clean if there are no animals in it, but if you're a farmer and you need food, you need animals. And so you have to accept the mess that comes with the animals. You know, it's easy to keep a house clean if no one lives in it. It's easy to keep a restaurant clean if no one eats at it. It's easy to keep a school clean if no one goes to it. The same is true at church. It's easy to keep a church clean if there are no people at it, but God wants to reach people. So that means there will be a mess, things to clean and people to get along with. So you must serve God by showing his love to others with the things we have, the words we say, and the things we do. One day I was at church and I was holding a cup of coffee in my hand and someone went to give me a hug and I accidentally dropped the coffee and it splattered all over the floor and the chairs splattered all over my friend. I was feeling a little embarrassed. I felt bad that it was gonna take so many people to clean it up. Someone who was helping me clean said, it's okay, Ryland. I'd rather you spill it here than at home because we like it when you're here. (laughs) That was encouraging. So the next time someone makes a mess at home, tell them, 
I'm glad you're here to make the mess. Next time you see a mess at church, think, and I'm glad there are people here. And that loving attitude will help you as you serve them. Uh, yeah, praise God for RBFK and thank you for our Rockwork for Kids team. I was also so encouraged this week by one of the devotionals in the youth groups, Align Devotionals. It says, uh, this one is based off of 1 John 4, 11. It says, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Just as a freed prisoner faces a choice, so do we with our spiritual freedom. Jesus paid our sentence, granting us freedom from sin and death. Will we continue self-serving ways or follow Christ's example of serving others? While self-interest is easier, serving others strengthens faith and relationships. Joining a ministry team can be trans a transformative step in serving. Through serving others for Christ, whether it's school, home, church, or in the community, we grasp the depth of Christ's service to us, nurturing stronger faith, embrace the challenge to serve, experience growth, and deeper understanding of Christ's sacrifice. The point to ponder, what does it mean to serve one another in love within the context of Christian community? Today, we're going to talk about another place in the Bible, an account in history that is absolutely pivotal. It's amazing. It's life-changing. It's about foot washing. It's where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Now, I'm happy to tell uh, many of you who maybe have been in church for years and have heard messages on this, I'm happy to report that we are not going to be washing each other's feet today. You can rest at ease. You don't have to be nervous that that's going to happen today. I don't know if you've ever had a pedicure I never have, but there have been some manly men in our church lately who tell me they get pedicures, and they say, one of them told me, you need to take your wife on a date and get a pedicure with her, and I said, that's amazing because I would never consider doing that because of you. I was afraid you would take my man card, and here you are telling me to go and do this. When it comes to foot washing, 2,000 years ago, it was very common. It was common courtesy when you came into the house to have your feet washed because uh, you'd been walking where animals were. Uh, you came into the house, you reclined at a table. It was custom to have your feet washed. What's awkward and socially unacceptable about this account is who does the foot washing. Foot washing was reserved in the ancient world for the lowest person on the totem pole, uh, the newest slave, uh, the rookie, the lowest servant, certainly not someone that would ever be uh, doing this as Jesus Christ, Son of God. Now, why is this passage so important? I'll tell you. Imagine you were going to die, and you knew when you were going to die, and you knew that you were going to die tomorrow. You would want to make tonight special. You would want to share with your spouse. You're going to call your mom and dad. Uh, you've been battling a disease, and you know that this is the end. I know who's someone who's going through that this very weekend. They know that this is it for them, and this is the end for them. And what you want to do is you want to make your last night count. And what you're going to do is reveal the content of your character and the depths of your soul to the people who you love. And Jesus knows that the next day he is going to die on the cross and what he chooses to do on his last night will be recorded and preserved and be a legacy moment. And so it says before the Passover celebration, the Passover celebration is when Jews celebrated when God sent the angel of death on the land of Egypt, which the Jews were slave in, and the angel of death passed over all the households who had uh, blood, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, and they were spared. It's amazing. And so they would commemorate this event with a specific meal. So he's with his disciples celebrating this specific meal. They're gathered together, and Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them, say this last part with me, to the very end. We, so few of us know what, it's, what it means to love someone to the very end. I remember hearing from a pastor who did a funeral for a woman who died in her late 90s, 
And she'd been married to her husband for 75 years. Can you believe that? 75 years. And the last couple years of her life, she did not know who her husband was. But he loved her and she died. And they, as they were getting ready to lower her casket into the ground, he threw himself over the casket and cried out these words. He said, I have loved you to the very end. And that's what Jesus does. And if you feel like you're apart from God today, God loves you even when you have forgotten who he is. And you can turn to him and he will love you to the very end. And he is here for you and he will be there for you even when your life ends. Verse 2, it was time for this supper that they're going to have. And the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. Amazing word in this passage is so. (laughs) Jesus knew that he'd been given all authority. So what? So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Nothing weird about what's taking place. Every person in that room would have expected this to take place. What's weird, what's awkward is about who is doing it. They're all uncomfortable. Jesus should not be doing this. How do you correct Jesus? He begins washing feet. No one wants to speak up and correct Jesus, except for Peter. He's more than willing to correct Jesus, as we know. So uh, he goes on. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing, uh, but someday you will. No, Peter protests, you will never wash my feet. This is not happening. You are not going to wash my feet, Jesus. But Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. So Peter realizes what's at stake and does a complete 80, 180 and exclaims, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. <laughs> and Jesus is so patient with him. I mean, first it's, no, you will never do this. And now it's like, give me a whole bath. <laughs> and if I'm Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like, Peter, stop grabbing the wheel. Let me drive. Just let me lead the way I want to lead. Let me do what I want to do. Stop trying to control this. But Jesus is so much more patient. Jesus replied, A person who's who's bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. Referring to Judas, who's betraying him. He goes on, You call me teacher. I want you to notice these. Oh, for Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, Not all of you are clean. Judas. I want you to notice two words that come next as he says, you call me teacher and you call me Lord. Do we have that? Okay, thank you. I'm getting ahead of myself. Andrew, you're doing it right. I'm doing it wrong. But it says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? And the truth is they did not understand what he was doing. And uh, the truth is that many of you have no clue what Jesus was doing. You call me teacher. The whole world, by the way, recognizes Jesus as a teacher. Practically the whole world. Uh, Every major religion is going to revere uh, Jesus as a teacher in some way. I want you to struggle with the next word that says Lord, and Lord here is the strongest possible word. I mean, it's the same word that would have been used for master and ruler of the universe. So you call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. But Jesus never claimed to be God, I guess. (laughs) It's okay to be sarcastic about that from time to time. Like, time and time again, he's like, yes, call me Lord. It's what I am. And as Christians, we believe in Emmanuel, God with us, God the eternal, that he became human being, 
because we were eternally separated from God because of our sin. And the consequence is death. That's why all human beings die, because we have sinned against God. Now, here's the scary news. You can never fix your relationship with God. There's nothing that you can do to make it remade, nothing you can do to repair it. The gulf between you and God is insurmountable, and no one can cross it. No one except Jesus Christ, because he represents God perfectly. Why? Because he is God. And so he represents God perfectly to you. He represents you perfectly to God. Why? Because he became human being. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. Jesus is so great at conflict management, he can manage the conflict between you and God because he represents God and man. And you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel we proclaim to the world. The problem is the world doesn't think they're at war with God anymore. And they don't understand how damaged their relationship with God is, that they would need a peacemaker. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. And so some of you have been a part of that awkward foot washing ceremony because of this verse. Well, let's just wash each other's feet and therefore cross this command off our list and, uh, and we'll say we'll obey Christ. But here's the reality. You haven't begun to obey this commandment of Christ. Verse 15, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. You see, uh, you can wash each other's feet, and, and I, I'm not trying to put that down. It's like that can be a beautiful example of, of wanting to follow Christ. But the truth is, you could wash every foot of every person in this church and, not, and still be disobedient to this command. Jesus Christ isn't talking specifically about foot washing. He's talking about serving. And he wants to teach us on the last night of his life that serving those who belong to Christ, those in the family of God, the body of Christ, is the most important message that he chose to communicate on the night that he was betrayed, the day before he died. So here's the problem. Some of us are going to take this account from Jesus and we're going to say, absolutely, I need to serve my spouse better. I need to serve my kids better. I need to serve my neighborhood better, my roommate better, and that's great, and we need to do that. But just because you serve your wife or husband better doesn't mean you're obedient to this command. You're missing what Jesus is saying. You're missing the call of Christ. You see, the Christian is ministered to by service. You might write that in. Before we talk about serving someone else, we've got to talk about what is so difficult for many, and that is our challenge to be ministered to well. I want you to notice where Peter uh, refuses to wash his feet. He says, you're not going to serve me. And Peter thinks that he's like standing up for the righteousness of Jesus. But the real thing he's doing is revealing his own pride. You're not going to serve me. If you really belong to Jesus, you're going to have to learn how to let other believers minister to you. If you think you're a self-contained church, like it's just my Bible, my backyard, my beer, and I'm all good, uh, you do not belong to Jesus. Because if you belong to him, you belong to his family, and if you belong to his family, you are served by his family. And the truth is we need to be blessed by each other in our brokenness. God redeems our brokenness. He redeems your brokenness and uses it to serve me. He redeems my brokenness and uses it to serve you. And we want to be a community who cares in your life. And some of you have had it rough, like really, really rough. And you need some healing. And you need some time to breathe. And you need to drop your wall and be ministered to by others. When's the last time you let someone wash your feet? Not literally, but come alongside you and minister to you. To say, you know, can someone take care 
of me? Can you pray for us? Can you uphold us? Can, you, can your presence share this burden so that it can push us to do the hard thing? Can you help us lean into the hard thing right now? So look, I've become convinced one of the main reasons people go from relationship to relationship, job to job, one of the main reasons people go from church to church is because they have not learned how to be ministered to. One of my first sermons, uh, I finished preaching and I went and I asked um, an elderly woman in our church who I just look up to and respect and think the world of, and I said, hey, what did you think of the sermon? I wanted some feedback. And she said, Ryland, I'm committed to this church and I can get something out of any sermon. (laughs) Now, I know on the surface that doesn't seem very encouraging. (laughs) But do you realize the depth of what she's saying and how encouraging what she's saying is? She's saying, Ryland, I'm committed to you. And I can let you minister to me. And so maybe it's not the best, but I can be ministered to out of it. And it was deeply encouraging. Do you understand the spiritual maturity behind that? You have to learn how to be ministered to through a sermon. A Christian has to, be, has to learn how to be led in worship, how to be greeted, how to be prayed for. They have to learn to be led. And oftentimes what people do is we're like Peter and we keep grabbing the wheel and instead of being ministered to by other people's service we're critical of their service well they don't lead a meeting very well okay but they lead it and they're doing the best they can with what they have for Jesus today be ministered to by their service Someone in our church was uh, leading something one day. They came up to me just terrified. They said, Rylan, I don't think I'm the leader that this project needs. And I told them, well, you're the leader we got. (laughs) And we'll follow you. Now, I want you to know, we have people in this church who love to minister. And you got to say, you know what? I'm going to let these people love me. I'm going to open up myself to these people. I'm going to let them greet me. I'm going to let them help me. I'm going to let them serve me. I'm going to let them lead me in worship. I'm going to let them teach me the Bible. I'm going to let them help me overcome my hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I'm going to let them be a sponsor for me, maybe, or encourage me. Because you don't belong to the family of God until you're willing to be ministered to by the family of God. And you know what's really, really difficult? You know what takes a lot of spiritual maturity? Is to allow other people in their brokenness, with all the contradictions that you see in them, to minister to you. The second is the Christian is gifted for service. Our world has artificially chosen what giftedness is. So you're beautiful, right? That must mean you're gifted. You're athletic, right? That must mean you're gifted. If you're a Kardashian, you're gifted. If you're a Kelsey, you're gifted. I think if you're a Kardashian or a Kelsey, you're confused. (laughs) But we think, oh, they must have something to say. Let's give them airtime. Let's listen into what they have to say. They're gifted. They must be wise. And they have enormous followings. And the problem is those people who are gifted in those kinds of way are so minuscule that the rest of us feel like we're worthless and every single day we listen to temptation from Satan that says, you're no good, you'll never make a difference, what do you have to offer? I want you to know that every single one of you is gifted by God to serve people. The call to serve the body of Christ is the same call that happens when you are saved by Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you is that you will discover the giftedness that God has given you. 1 Peter 4 says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. It's amazing. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. So how do you discover your gift? You discover your gift by serving. You say, I'm just going to serve. 
I mean, you think Jesus Christ's gift of service was foot washing? Like that was just his special ability, like he knew something just about toe cheese that other people didn't know, and like he was just really able to do things there that no one else could do. No, he did it because no one else there did it. And so he served. And he grew, it says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God. He discovered the fullness of who he was. Why does he keep saying, my time has not yet come? My time has not yet come. Because his time was fulfilled. The fulfillment of time came through because he served people and he served God and he finished the work of God. Serve Christ by serving his body, the church. I've discovered all my gifts by serving the church. God wants to unlock your giftedness and grow your giftedness. But the only way you can do that is by stop grabbing the wheel, <laughs> let Jesus minister to you, and say, I will serve, and meet a need. And Jesus washed feet because no one else did. You know, we have people in this church who serve so faithfully, people who fulfill the biblical command, the gift of hospitality of door holding did you know that door holding is actually like a position in the bible a, a greeter and and peter uh, uh peter says as the world gets worse and worse offer more hospitality so we just said let's just name a whole ministry team off of the bible and call it the hospitality team we have people who are happy to spend time and minister to your kids for those of you who have children they're being taught in school that they are a cosmic accident and then the school is shocked when kids live like it. You know what they're being taught here? That God created them on purpose, for a purpose. That there's a God and he loves you. And it's the most important information they're going to receive in their life. And they can't just hear it from their parents. Every study will tell you that there needs to be a number of caring adults who are willing to say that to your kid. We have people who relentlessly, gracefully serve your teenagers and students. That devotional, that student devotional I read to you that was put together by an amazing volunteer in our student ministry. We have people who serve on safety team every week. Why? Because the world is not full of all nice people. We have people on medical team because there are medical emergencies. We have people who open up their home for gatherings, who lead you in a small group. I won't list all the teams, all the people, but they're all valuable, seen and unseen. Just like your body has prominent parts of your body that you can see. But there are other things going on here that are pretty important to my body that you can't see. But they're all valuable. And I can be filled through serving. That's number three, is the Christian is filled by God through serving. So when a Christian asks, am I being fed? You gotta understand the, the meaning of that question. Listen, I'm never going to be able to feed you through my sermons to the point where you are filled, to the point where you are full. There is a hunger that is inside every single one of us that can only be filled through serving Jesus. The disciples didn't understand this at this point. Uh, Jesus has a life conversation with a woman at a well, at Jacob's well. She runs into the village and says, there's a man at the well who has completely changed my life. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, you need to eat something. Like, take a break, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. <laughs> Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Jesus says that he is fed by God when he serves God and serves God's people. Some of you are starving. Your souls are starving because the only person you serve is yourself. The only people you serve are those who can pay you back. We serve Jesus by serving like Jesus, by serving his church. And number four, the Christian is commanded by Jesus to serve. Do as I have done to you, he said. You'll be blessed if you do it. There's a great passage in Luke where Jesus says, you keep calling me Lord, 
but you won't do what I say. That verse puts the fear of God in me. Jesus commanded the disciples to serve. Now here's the problem. We live in a society where everybody is busy doing their own thing. We don't help anymore. We're trapped in our own worlds. We're trapped by our own lives. A man was driving his truck one day, and the truck broke down. It broke down in a quick hurry, just died as he's on the highway. He was in the left lane. There's traffic. He couldn't get over in time. By the time he gets over, he ends up stalled, blocking both lanes. There's debris in the, uh, on the side of the road. And because the truck is heavy and he's at a slight incline, he can't push the truck off to the side of the road. Traffic is backing up behind him. He calls a friend to pull him home. The friend's busy. Calls a friend to pull him to the side of the road. Friend's busy. He calls a tow truck. It's going to be 47 minutes. It's blazing hot outside. People are backed up behind him for a ways now. They're screaming at him. They're honking at him. Every once in a while, someone can kind of squeeze through and get by, and they're sure to let the guy know that he's number one in their book. He turns on the radio. The traffic report is talking about the backup that this is causing. It's affecting hundreds of people now, maybe thousands of people now. Everybody is stuck. Yet not one person gets out to help him push the truck to the side of the road. Everybody's stuck but no one will help. Listen, God is preparing his church for something. I believe Rockbrook is going to play a part in it. I believe God has somewhere for Rockbrook to go. I'm not making that up. I truly feel that and sense that. And God has somewhere for Rockbrook to go. But for us to get there, you have to be prepared to get out and help push to be willing to get out the basin and wash each other's feet. And that's what it's going to take for God to move in amazing ways among us. And my prayer is that you're ready to serve. And, and I hope you don't hear this next part as shame, but it's what someone told me and it motivated me. It's that when I refuse to serve Christ by serving his church, I have made myself the Lord and made it my church. Some of you are going to a cult and you don't even know it because you've made yourself God. But you decide what it is. Jesus Christ is the head of this church. And so when you go to church, is it his church or your church? And what legacy will you leave in it? You know, if someone asks your kids, what, what's the most important thing to your mom and dad? Would your church be on the list? Please don't ask my kids that. I don't know what they would say. <laughs> I mean, I hope they would say the church. But are you leaving a legacy or are you leaving a vacancy? This passage is so inspiring. Psalm twenty-two thirty: Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. That's what I want for your kids. That's what I want for future generations, that they will hear all of what the Lord has done. Would you bow your head with me? Pray with me, please. Uh, before we go to prayer, I just want you to imagine something with me. Think of someone in our church who uh, serves faithfully. They make an impact. Just someone you see time and time again, joyfully serving others. Could be uh, just a simple, faithful, loving act of holding the door open for you, greeting you. Uh, could watch your kids in RBFK. They're caring for your student at youth group. Many areas of ministry, many things that that could be. Just think of someone you see serving joyfully, faithfully, get their picture in your mind. And I just want to ask you now, imagine with me, what would Rockbrook look like if all its members served like them? What difference would the church make in our lives and in our community if all of Rockbrook's members served like them? Father, thank you for serving us. I pray that we would be willing to serve no matter what the task is. 
if it's washing feet, giving up our time, whatever it is. Lord, you make no apology when you call people to service. And so to honor you, I will not make no apology for calling people to serve your church. I pray that we would follow you as our teacher, yes, but also I pray that we would serve you as Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.